job title, like what your job mm -hmm. is, and then maybe explain it a little bit, and then we'll go from there. Sure. So my name is Nellie McAdams. Um, I have a law degree from Lewis and Clark uh, with a certificate in natural resources and environmental law. Um, and my job title right now is Farm Preservation Program Director at Rural Farm Corp, where I work on farm succession planning and preservation of agricultural land um, through policy development and program development, um, education, and outreach. My name is Courtney Schaff, and I work at the Oregon Watershed Council Board. We're a state agency that gives lottery funds to give out grants for native fish and wildlife species and habitat. Um, I have a very funny title. It's called Capacity Programs Coordinator. Um, but what it is is I manage a seven statewide grant program um, that um, impacts local stakeholders to do on the ground work, and I work on the policy related issues related to those um, stakeholders, obviously. Um, I'm Lindsay Trant, and I work at, at Friends and Family Farmers, which is a statewide organization here in Sewa that does advocacy work on behalf of small and mid-sized family farms. Um, and I'm a, I'm a grassroots organizer, so I'm kind of out in the field talking to producers, farmers, and uh, working with our policy director to translate um, what we figure out as the top issues and policy and action through our work in the capital. Uh, my name is Mike Getz. I'm the general counsel for the Oregon Citizens Utility Board. So I'm an attorney. I have a law degree from the University of Oregon, so just don't hold that against me. <laughs> but just down the road, yeah, and I got a statement position in environmental and natural resources law. Um, so the Oregon Citizens Utility Board, or CUB, um, we're the residential rate payer advocate in the state, so we were established by a ballot initiative back in 1984 to represent the interests of residential customers of the large investor-owned utilities in the state. So that's Pacific Power, Portland General Electric, Idaho Power Company, Northwest Natural, Avista, and Cascade Natural Gas. Um, <clears throat> so the primary scope of the work that we do is uh, intervene in cases in front of the Public Utility Commission of Oregon. So, the state government agency in Salem that regulates these big investor owned facilities and in representing residential customers. You know, we try to keep rates low, we also try to minimize the risk. Um, we'll put them in kind of close on coal plants and um, move away from fossil fuels and uh, work to do all work in energy efficiency, electric vehicle policy, and things like that. So I, uh, I litigate in the administrative law context. Uh, my name is William Gerke. I'm also working with the Oregon Citizens Utility Board. My job title is economist. I have a master's degree in applied economics. Uh, I'm essentially a professional witness for CUB. In a lot of these cases before the Public Utility Commission, there's testimony with complex issues, and uh, you have to use evidence to answer some policy questions. And I uh, work on those cases and spend countless hours reviewing <laughs> what's going on. Uh, and uh, something we're working on recently in CUB is we're looking at uh, retiring our coal plants in Utah, Wyoming, and other things. We're taking on behind that. And uh, it's really fascinating. And beyond the regulatory work that Will and I do, CUB is very involved in the legislature as well. And we're involved in issues when we have discussion. Legislation that would impact on the And I'm Samantha Brecken, for those of you who don't know me yet, I'm here at OSU um, in applied economics. I'm going to teach environmental law and interest in environmental law, policy and economics, and cultural law, and intro to food systems. And um, I have a law degree from the University of Minnesota, and I've worked in other nonprofit settings too, including um, Farmers Legal Action Group in St. Paul, Minnesota. So, I have some background, but full disclosure, I'm on the Board of Governors now. That's how I got in touch with these guys. And Lindsay, has, I work with her when she was a master's student here. And Courtney and I have daughters who are the same age. And um, Nellie and I have worked on farm succession projects. And, and so um, I just want to thank all of you for coming and sharing your experience and expertise with our students. So you won't hear much from me. You can talk to me anytime you need to talk to me. And um, we do have welcome students who are on WebEx. We do have a few. So 
I will check this once in a while. If they have questions, I can help with that. I'm not sure if I can make the audio work so I can relay questions via chat. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So to get started, uh, I guess the first question I had was just kind of what drove you to your career, your specific careers. And you guys can all answer, a couple of you can answer, and then all of you guys can ask questions as well. It's an opportunity to hear you guys' stories and learn a little bit more about your career. Okay. All right, I can start. Um, I think I'm close to an age to you guys, but I'm on the younger age of the panel. Um, <laughs> So when I was uh, growing up, uh, I grew up during the Great Recession, and uh, Recession, and uh, I wanted to understand the economics of it, and I wanted to just the, the impact of it on life, and how uh, people lost their jobs, uh, people, uh, you know, there's a lot of economic turmoil, and I wanted to understand why that happened. And uh, I went to study it in uh, in school, and uh, where I went, went to school was a state agency, um, and I had an internship there, and I got a, I a, a job there as an energy analyst, and I just really fell in love with the work and all of the uh, interplay with it and how you can, uh, energy is kind of like the lifeblood of the economy, it makes things more productive, it powers our goods. And I just found the whole field really interesting. And every single week I come into work, I learn something new. And I just thought it was a rich field to, to dedicate and uh, learn more about. Yeah, I'm mine here. Um, so, yeah, I also think that I was very similarly situated to probably most folks in this room. Um, graduated, I'm from outside of Chicago originally. So, I graduated from the University of Illinois with an environmental science. Um, major degree and uh, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Uh, I'd always kind of thought about law school and you know, it wasn't really finding kind of meaningful work and maybe what I wanted to do down the road. So <clears throat> I ended up deciding to go to law school for environmental law. So I worked in the schools that had good programs for that. Um, specific, specifically, you would have really good public interest environmental law program as well. And, you know, frankly, moving to this part of the country was exciting. Side and you know, just like you would see different parts of the country. And, uh, yeah, so I came out here with, you know, just like generally, I want to practice environmental law, but maybe didn't know exactly what that meant or what, um, you know, it kind of work went into it. And obviously, it's very interdisciplinary and multifaceted. Um, so, kind of through the coursework I took down at U of O, um, and the internships I had, and a lot of the work I did primarily, like preliminarily, was in um, Endangered Species Act litigation. And public lands defense. I was in Utah for a little bit before the role that I'm in, but I was always very drawn to energy work because of um, how pragmatic you can be working with big companies and actually getting them to affect meaningful change. Because I mean, it's one of the only industries in the country that has. It really is the only industry in the country that has the emissions profile that it does, and also it's fully regulated at the investor-owned kind of large utility scale level. So. Kind of found out about the work that Cub did and uh, was, you know, excited that they had the public interest spent and also I was kind of over climate change goals. Um, so, yeah, really just through, through networking, for example, like this, through folks through the alumni channels, the University of Oregon, um, and things like that. Um, I fell into the role now. <clears throat> been with Cub for three years. And, yeah, but I mean, really just kind of continuing the, you know, advance in my education and also like more options that are out there and, and I think it's small and just kind of help with that. Um so I went to Willamette for my undergrad, not far from here, and I graduated with a degree in sociology and I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with it when I graduated. So I started farming. Um <laughs> because it was I was just learning about small farms. I had no idea about local food when I was in college and I started to know more about it. I got really interested in like food systems. I started working at a local farm in um, um, Salem and got to experience life as a farm worker for a few years and uh, had a lot of trouble uh, making ends meet, particularly in the winter. And so I started picking up extra jobs and one of those jobs was at the uh, state capital in Salem. 
Um, so I started working as a committee assistant, um, particularly for the House Committee on Land Use Water and something else, agriculture. It was agriculturally related. And so in the summer, I was working on small family farms. And then in the winter, I started working at the state capitol. Um, and I got to see firsthand what the landscape of ag policy looked like in Oregon. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have any sort of, I guess, I guess I naively thought, like, oh, there's probably people at the capital for those things in the capital. And there are, to an extent, but it's huge. And um, so I got to see that firsthand and got really interested in an organization that was there at the Capitol lot from Sterling Farmers, which is where I work now. Um, got to experience um, that there's not as many voices for small farms, and that, that really interests me personally. Um, and so I decided to come to OCO and get my master's degree in public policy. So I graduated in 2017 here um, with my master's in public policy, worked with Chris Peeble, I was here a lot, I worked with the OSU Center for Small Farms. Um, and I saw, while I was finishing my thesis, a job opening up, opening up with friends and family farmers, and I decided to take advantage of that. And uh, apply for it, got the job, now I'm with friends and family farmers, and I was really drawn to the idea of being more on the side of action and being in a position to like hands on effect change. Um, that's really what brought me, I think, from being on a working on farms, experiencing policy, combining my interests by getting a master's, and then kind of putting that all into action with my current role. Um, I am originally from Ohio and got a um, undergrad in environmental science, a um, small school in Ohio, um, and then spent about five years working for nonprofits, a variety of different environmental nonprofits, um, and really seeing, um, having a passion for science and seeing for the, for how work gets done on the ground to see what we'll, we'll do. So I came to OSU and got my master's in um, environmental sciences. Yay! Um, strong opinion about the environmental science program here. It's not necessarily positive, so think, think squarely about where you're headed if you go that direction. Um, but um, I just, I've always been a person that loves to learn. So the program here did give me right uh, an opportunity to create the program I wanted. I learned a lot about what I wanted. Um, and kind of taught myself along the way. One of those rare graduates that I defended my master's thesis and interviewed for a job at the state the next day. Got that state, 13, that job 13 and a half years later, I'm still working at the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. I am on my fifth job. So I, I graduated with a very science-based um, master's, knowing that that's not where I wanted to spend my career, but it paid for my master's degree. I'm like, Policy doesn't technically usually pay for you to get your master's, so I got that. But I got I got the science based master's, but I made a program that's very heavily policy based. Um, and now I do all policy work, um, really working to enable like local partners all across the state to get their work done. I all I do is push paper. I tell people, but I enable the folks that are doing work all across the state to get their work done with less red tape. Um. I guess my career, I sort of felt like I've been spiraling closer and closer to what I want to do. But if you would have asked me why I made any of the decisions that I made on that route, I would not have known why. <laughs> like, it only makes sense in retrospect, but I had, did not have a vision at all. I knew that I liked logic puzzles and that my dad was an attorney and, you know, law school just always seemed natural. Not something I really thought of too hard. It just seemed like it was a good way to get things done. And I'd always thought of it more as a credential. And um, that really does rewire your brain, for better or worse. So it's helped me write research projects with Christy. You know, I was not a good writer at all. I don't know why they don't teach outlining in, like, undergrad. I never learned that. So, you know, the skills that I got out of law school, you know, I do not remember anything that um, uh, they asked me on the bar. I would flunk it down <laughs> yeah. at this point. But... Um, but it did help me process information. And I think that that has been useful to me the whole time. Um, my dad, as I said, was an attorney, but he was also a farmer. And um, so I grew up with both of them. I like to call myself an attorney farmer as well. Uh, so I'm taking over the farm and I'm technically an attorney, but I'm working a little bit more on policy um, and program development at this point. 
Um, I wasn't as interested in individual transactions, more in system-wide change. Um, after, well, during law school, I thought I was going to go into international environmental law until I went to, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of like public interest law projects. I've, um, a lot of law schools have them, and it's a great way to get paid to do an internship. Um, I did one in Berlin at a place called Ecologic and um, got to do international environmental policy work and realized that there was zero teeth to it and you know nothing could be assured and um, it was a lot of great aspirations but not a lot of things on the ground so that made me sort of um, swing in the other direction I ended up um, becoming the legislative assistant to the um, then representative now speaker Kotek in the legislature right after um, law school realized that I didn't like being impartial on issues and being someone else's culture. I'm much more of a, an advocate. <laughs> it's hard for me to decide my opinion. So um, I, uh, and, and I did want to work in something so abstract, so I started working for a farm. Mm -hmm. I worked um, on a farm for a couple seasons, um, managed a farm store, um, worked for friends and family farmers as well as their staff attorney and next generation program director and then um, started consulting and writing gap analyses um, for organizations around agricultural issues and just realizing that that was my jam. Um, I formed the Farm Preservation Program at Rogue Farm Court, where I my real true passion for the farm succession planning and farmland preservation from development. So, um, and plus I worked with Courtney at OEA, we can't forget that. <laughs> that was um, helping to, um, put in place a uh, program that's right here and here's my heart, the Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program. So it was a program that a bunch of agricultural and conservation organizations developed in 2000, well, maybe actually 2017. It's been many years in the making. Um, but I had, um, you know, great interactions uh, passing that program through the state legislature and then um, got to work for OWEB, um, with the commission that developed the rules for that program. So we wrote a whole new chapter of um, Oregon Revised, well, no, Oregon Administrative Rule. Rule. Thank you. Um, and I mean, that was an amazing experience. And so now I'm no longer with OM, but I am advocating for funding for that program. Wonderful. Uh, does anyone have any questions so far that they would like to ask? For those of you that have attended law school, looking back, would you make that decision again? I would, yes. Um, yeah, I think for many of the reasons, I, mean, I think for me it was um, a great way to gain a skill set, which I think is widely applicable to many different things as far as. Being able to think critically through issues, kind of issue spot, obviously the writing component of it, um, comfortable kind of speaking and presenting in public spaces and learning how to, to navigate that type of arena. I mean, I think that helps you in, in the policy realm, obviously it helps you as a litigator, it's necessary for that. Um, but I think for me, it was it was a great way to kind of expand upon, you know, this general liberal arts and science degree that I had when I graduated uh, undergrad. and you know, all of that, you know, maybe taken with a grain of salt because I do consider myself to be very fortunate to have found a career in the field that I wanted to work in. And, you know, I realized that that's not, that's not always the case. And, you know, um, one thing that law school, uh, one critique I have of law school is that I don't know if it does a great job inherently in and of itself in training, you know, folks to be attorneys. Really. There's, there's not like a clinical portion of it. Or any real requirement that you you know take you know work or any, like you know have to have jobs or anything like that. Like you know, I know people that took classes during the summer and graduated a semester early and take the bar and to pass. And it's like oh I'm a lawyer and I have no idea what that means or how to. You know? <laughs> so yeah, I do I do think it, it is important to kind of put yourself out there and get some practical experience while you're in law school if you choose to go that route. But um, yeah, for me it was the right decision. Be in the place where no hands. I agree. Um, I 
with, I mean, all of the jobs I've gotten, I've gotten partly because of my logic. Whether that was the manager of a farm store or, you know, some of the positions I got whooping or, you know, everything that I got, I think it is a credential. Um, it means something. It's a currency that you can, um, uh, it is helpful on resume. Um, the critical thinking pieces are important. And I think, you know, I can complain about um, law school itself. It probably shouldn't be three years. Absolutely, I believe, um, you know, more uh, of a clinical component. Um, the bar is a hazing ritual as far as those go. I prefer binge drinking. You know, there's so many different things that could be changed about that whole process. But then our predecessors went through it. They forced everybody after them to go through it. But, you know, it also proves that you can go through a lot of pain and discomfort and come out the other side and, and still smile. And so, like, you know, for that reason, like it's an institution like any other that somehow signifies things that um, you would otherwise have to take a long time explaining your personal personal situation. I passed the bar twice, <laughs> two different states, <laughs> so it can be done. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Never again. <laughs> Nightmare. <laughs> I have a question. So, okay, when I was eight years old, I wrote President George Bush a letter um, about air pollution, habitat degradation, all that fun stuff because I was trying hard. And uh, so, this is basically something I've wanted to do. And I guess my question for you guys is where do you think the change is? Like, where do you think? we could put ourselves in a position of advocacy to be most effective to inspire change on issues like climate change, uh, habitat, preservation, that kind of thing. Like, do you think it's important to kind of expose yourself to a wide variety of areas, or do you think there's a certain place that you would recommend? I know that's a really vague question, but if any of you have some idea. I, I mean, I'll jump in because it's, it's actually interesting because um, so my husband is, works um, Natural resources. Also, he works with weeds on the eastern side of the state. And one of the conversations we have regularly around our table is how lucky we are that we both work at the local and the policy level to understand diverse perspectives. Mm -hmm. So when you ask about you know where is change, I think change is at all places. Change is at the policy level, mm -hmm. um, state and federal. But change is also at that local farmer or small farmer level and if you can't understand that perspective on the east west side of the state or all over the united states or anywhere then you're going to um, have a harder time understanding how to make change happen at any level of government um oh sorry no you go ahead um well i was just going to say that advocacy is very tiring and not monetarily um you know uh, <laughs> uh very, I mean, yeah, you you do a lot for very little money, and so unless you care about what you do, you're not going to be a very effective change agent. And so I would say that the most effective place is the thing that you care about, because when your face lights up, that's when other people light up about what you're talking about. Um, and it you know might take a little bit more time to find that, but I think being able to attach your story to the thing that you're advocating for is your fuel that keeps you going when you're working 80 hour weeks to get in a deadline and um, still not in your own salary. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was very personal. I would take the question in a different way uh, a little bit. You said different areas. I actually think that this part of the country, I'm from a different part of the country. This part of the country is such a saturation of people who are trying to affect change. I think there's a lack in other parts of the country where people don't have the same viewpoint. I'm very liberal in this area. And uh, if people were to have more effective advocates for the environment or pollution in those areas, I think it would make a bigger impact over there. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I've heard that there are an abundance of environmental lawyers and policymakers like, mm -hmm. in this area. It makes sense. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I guess I can add a little bit on and Great question. Thank you. Um, one thing that I always try to remember, there's a lot of impact my questions, so we one part of it, but like one thing that I always try to remind myself of in, in the work that I do, and you know, Will and I are bogged down in a rate case and just looking at stacks and stacks of numbers and like that's the utilities kind of, you know, their earnings and the 
accounting practices and things like that. And just like knowing that like big picture of what we're trying to do, even if you're making like incremental change along the way, like those victories are really important as well. And so it's, you know, you don't want to let kind of the, the perfect be the enemy of the good sometimes in your advocacy. And, um, you know, there's, you know, there's obviously kind of like larger like victories that can be made and things that might make a headline and things like that. But just the fact that there's advocates out there um, like working for a cause, you know, ours is you know very real because like we're the utility watchdog for these like big corporations for residential customers. Um, but just knowing that, you know, that like you're out there and other people are out there and, you know, just uh, I'm dragging out a little bit here, but just like just finding value in those incremental smaller victories. And I think like where, you know, like part of the question is like where is like the best place to affect change? I think you really need to just take a hard look at whatever practice area you're working in or whatever the regulatory environment is of where you end up working and things like that. A lot of times, like in, in the work that we do, we can we can get victories in the regulatory arena, maybe again and again and again. And you know, PGE wants to build two new gas plants in the gorge, but we convince them to look at their modeling a different way, and then you know, they ended up like getting hydroelectric power purchases from BPA instead. So like we were able to like really change the way that they conducted their business kind of through our regulatory advocacy. Sometimes that's not always possible, and maybe the most effective way is to go to the legislature and get some kind of top-down mandate that, that kind of restructures an industry. Um, but it's just like kind of thinking what your long-term goal is and being creative and, and having the skill set to be able to approach it through different avenues. You know. Thank you. That definitely answers my question. And I think I want to add one more thing just because this is about like what you want to do. Um, that when I advise students, so I have both a law degree and I have a master's in applied economics, or agri first economics, is what it's called. But um, you have to be passionate about the goal that you're working for, right? Whatever your cause is. If you, you know, are passionate about that, that is step number one. But I found in between undergrad and law school and um, the whole works that. The jobs I did in between were about topics that I care about, but when I went to work every day, I was not excited about running payroll for the nonprofits that I worked for and managing the data field. Right. Some people are cut out for that, and that's awesome. And I got a master's in applied economics, and I love what Will does, but I would not want to do this job every day. That's not where my daily passion lies. And my husband's an electrical engineer. He makes renewable energy technology. He codes and works on electronic stuff for fun <laughs> in his spare time, right? Like, he loves the process of doing that thing, and he cares about the outcome. And I love and still love the intellectual stimulation of the legal field. <laughs> and I think skill set translates to the teaching field, and which is what I'm doing. And... I think the outcome of spreading that to the next generation, I'm very proud of that. I'm very happy that that's the place where I'm affecting change, right? So I think you have to both marry, you know, the, the outcome that you care about in the world with what do you want to sit down and do it every day? Because you'll be miserable if you don't, if you're only looking at the, the outcome. Based. And I, I have one thing to add. It's my job, so like I, I'm a in my job, I'm or, or what's called organizing the nonprofits, so I'm out um, talking to people and turning, essentially I'm turning what people, our supporters of our organization want into some sort of change through policy or something else, right? And so I think that you guys, they can hit on some of that, where it's like, part of, like there's like half of that where it requires, like Nelly was saying, passion for what you're doing, because you have to inspire people, right? You're not going to create change without inspiring people. Um, but the other half, and this is something I guess I wish I learned long ago, so I'm just going to tell you now. You're welcome. <laughs> um, is, is the ability to follow up. Like, I feel like that's one of the most key things with affecting change in any goal is that ability of following up with people. Because so many people, like, want something. You know, like, oh, they want to see the change. Yeah, sure. Like, they support small farms. They support 
clean energy they support, you know, whatever it is, but really like that ability to to follow up is I think what is it a, a more of an ability to create change? And I think you can take that into many different roles. Mm -hmm. So many of you mentioned that you have about current or previous positions that you held, like starting positions maybe, like internships or something um, before your current position. Do you have any advice on um, how to go about that, like how, getting your foot in the door or making yourself a very desirable candidate for positions such as those? Um, I think the first thing I can think of is like, if, and you guys can like differ with me on this. I think it's really okay to ask, like, if you meet somebody and you're interested in their job, ask, ask to have a cup of coffee with them. That's like, I feel like the number one thing is like, people want to share what they learned with you from their career path. And so if you meet someone and they're in a role that you're interested in or even just kind of like curious about, ask them to sit down and, and, and chat with you about it, have what we call informational meetings. Um, and I think that that's one of the biggest way to get your foot in the door. In the door. Um, that's, that's how I am where I am today um, in many different ways. Um, and yeah, I think that that's the number one thing you can do really. Um, I would, I mean, building up that, like don't be afraid to ask for I mean, informational interviews. I think they are so valuable. I know everyone <coughs> in, I've ever met has been open their eyes to that. Um, or find a mentor in someone that's in a field that you're interested in. Again, I've been a mentor multiple times. I'm always honored if someone asks me, hey, will you will you help me? Will you guide me? Will you they might not have a job for you, but be willing to um, sit down and have coffee, look at resumes, um, have conversations about that. Um, and then the other thing is it's just it's hard work and it's how you show up. Every, it's how you show up anytime you interact with someone. Um, it's how you send your resume in or send an email or how you work at that free internship that you show up and then you get a great amount of recommendations and you can make it to the next place. But um, it's really just about, you know, showing up with your all, whether it's free or you're getting paid a lot of money, but, you know, then that's how you make a name for yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's, I remember kind of hearing this again and again, and it's, it can seem like, you know, just like how important networking is, right? I used to like, oh, like, all right, I don't know what's too important, whatever I'll do at some point. But like really putting yourself out there is, is truly, you know, it, it's, it is a really important component to it. And yeah, to kind of piggyback, um, you know, I think you'd be surprised at the, the amount of people that are willing to help share their story and kind of how what that's them the place that they're in and are willing to help you know, you through your process, because the reality is that we've all been in the same position. And, and I'm the same way. I'm acutely aware that I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in right now if it wasn't for, you know, leveraging kind of context that I met through my law school's alumni network. And I had a fellowship through like this environmental natural resources law center from the U of O. And they were like, go out and meet a lot of people. And, you know, it kind of took even putting me in a situation where like networking was really at my fingertips or made me to even like, start doing it in earnest, but it was kind of through those connections that, you know, opportunities, um, you know, ended up presenting themselves. And it's one of those things too, where once again, kind of just this incremental approach, like there's not always going to be a job available when you reach out to somebody for an informational interview or any kind of position, but the more that you kind of put yourself out there and say, Hey, this is my skill set. This is what I want to do. This is what I can bring to the table more people you meet, the more likely somebody is to think of you when an opportunity does open up. And then as far as getting your foot in the door, I mean, once you do, yeah, it's just a matter of, I mean, you probably know the rest here, but just work hard and do your best and, you know, just be the first one there and last one to leave and all that kind of stuff. But also, you know, you should be cognizant of, you know, don't, you don't, you don't want to take a job with the expectation to move into another department if maybe that jump isn't like Feasible. You know what I mean? Like taking a job as like I don't know, like some kind of admin staff at a nonprofit, having a law degree or something, and you want to be an attorney there someday. Like maybe that doesn't work, whatever their internal politics are. So just like, um, yeah, just being kind of cognizant of whatever people you're looking into, and just kind of continuing to turn whatever you know, contacts you have. I agree with everything that's been said. The only thing that I would add is. Um, 
if your graduate school or any school has some funding for your internship, I think that sometimes helps when organizations are considering to take on interns. Um, just I've worked with a lot of interns. Often, you know, some of the ones who are working for free are amazing and you know dedicate a lot of time to it, especially if they're getting credit. But I think we all sort of have sort of a capitalist mentality that unless someone has some cash or some kind of compensation for long hours that are being spent, they might not um, be able to follow through on projects. So being able to come with your own funding, I think is a better selling point if there's an organization you really want to work with. Thank you. Perfect, sorry, I feel like I, I feel like I have a series of questions. Um, one is I was wondering about conservation with the type of work that you do. Um, if you're talking about how local communities are where the action happens, and I know that when you mentioned um, like advocating in areas with different perspectives that aren't so liberal, uh, and how much you think their own biases, you know, they already have that perspective, comes from, from without versus within, if that makes sense. And like where you see overlap or gap between conservation movements and what's happening like in local areas. Um, I mean, sorry, you guys can jump in. I, um, I think um, we all in the Lima Valley do a disservice to our neighbors on the east side of the state because the farmer, the rancher that's managing their property out there isn't going to use the same words that you and I use on the, on the west side of the state about conservation and restoration. But that landowner cares deeply about the health of their land and their property and their practices because that's how they put food on the table and pay their bills. Um, so when I talk to and meet with our local partners and, and, and ask them, you know, how do they operate in different parts of the state, it's because they sit and listen and they find out, you know, what are the words the local partners are using in Burns when they talk about the value of their land. And if you can understand how they value their land and the, and the words they, they use, then you find that common ground and have that conversation. So the, the, in general, it's not that the folks, it's not that people don't believe in conservation and restoration when you're in a different community, but so they're using different words and they're looking at it through different lens than we are here. Um, when I was in law school, the best class that I took was a field study that was in Eastern Oregon, where we went and spoke with BLM officials and Forest Service officials and ranchers and played pool at the pool house. We were staying at the Nauther um, Wildlife um, Reserve. And um, one of the ranchers that we spoke to, his name was Stacy Davies, and um, he went around the room and had all of us say our names and what we wanted to do with our degrees. And um, one woman said, I want to sue the people who develop wetlands. And Stacy asked, do you want to sue people or say wetlands? And she says, sue people. And it, the, the conversation went too quickly, I think, for her to even understand what had happened. But Stacy was like, next. You know, it's just like, and that like was huge for me because I realized like white knight or black knight, you're still a knight. You're still trying to win by aggression. And um, it just, uh, really changed my perspective in terms of the tactics and the approaches and the respect that it gives to um, other people in our community. So um, folks on the east side feel very done to rather than um, partnered with. And um, I think that feeling comes from a lot of years of experience um, and it's very valid. And so um, partnership and how you approach um, all of this work, as Courtney was saying, listening to people um, is the most important thing. I think we have so many more shared goals than anybody acknowledges. Um, yeah, I, I can jump in on that one. And the caveat that you know the work that Will and I do is is a little bit different because you know we have this statutory mandate to represent all customers in the state, including those on the east side and. And oftentimes we need to juggle policy decisions or even stay out of other disputes because it has the potential to maybe shift costs even within kind of the residential class from one group to another. And, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're making decisions that help Oregonians as, as a whole. Um, but the best advice that I can say um, as far as like interacting with folks that might have different values and ideologies um, 
I actually, very recent anecdote last week was out on a, a field tour for our organization to Lakeview, Oregon, uh, which is, uh, most folks don't know where it is, but it's out in Lake County, um, really deep southeastern Oregon, near like the uh, top the uh, heart of the animal. Heart out wild, heart out wild. There's what? Yeah. It's minuscule inside there. There's not much more to people. Like, yeah, yeah. It's a tiny little one. You know, Lake, Lake County is kind of like out of Massachusetts or something. Like that. And yeah, so this is a really beautiful part of the state, but kind of tucked away. There's like 10 miles north of the California border down there. And um, I can tell you that the sediment out there is just like, Saying here that they kind of need to deal with many of the decisions that are made out here in the valley, you know, in Salem and in Portland and some areas like that can have like a really disparate impact on those kinds of communities. And so it was it was it was really cool for me to kind of go in and say, you know, here's what Cub is, here's who we are, here's what we do, um, what are the issues that we should know about just kind of conducting outreach. And, and it was very surprising um, a little bit. Um, you know, it's a very conservative community out there, but also the one that is like really starting to realize the benefits of renewable energy and, you know, kind of historically this like forestry based economy that, you know, has kind of gone, gone you know, the wayside because of kind of reducing yields and things like that. But now we're realizing this like amazing potential that they have solar energy out there. And so like, oh, it's huge, like, you know, thermal basin and so like, pumping energy out from the earth to this huge kind of the, the hospital and things like that and so it's just like and I met with some folks from like this local nonprofit out there once again kind of like conservative ranching kind of spoke historically but are you know really doubling down on kind of renewable energy investment which is really cool to see that like I'm from a way different background than I was in Portland and you know I went to this liberal law school and grew up in you know a liberal city and things like that but I want the same thing that these guys do. We're just coming out of a totally different place. And so it's just a matter of really taking a step back and, and really visiting and, and finding comfort. You know, I went for a ride with um, this is guy from this local nonprofit. We're taking a tour some solar farms. And, you know, I was like, let's just like kind of keep talking about what we do and say what we want to do where we overlap. And then, like, that I ended up not taking all of them really hit it off. So, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's really just kind of breaking down these crazy notions that you have. Republicans, mm -hmm. right? You know, because I can get, 
you know, I see certainly the fact that trends are not aligned with what it is that, you know, our Department of Health is doing, right? And so it's really just about like, yeah, what are you, what do you care about? You know, that's enough, that's enough to start that conversation. But if you're willing to go to places that don't have as many resources, and I think that's maybe a little bit of the difference between um, Oregon versus modern that those resources are desperately needed, but they don't, there's not that many people there, you know, by no service, but there are here. So, whatever that's worth. Mm -hmm. I can sit in right there. Well, you have a question? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I come from, uh, like a probably very different background than a lot of people in the field. I come from emergency, the emergency management world. So I spent time in the Coast Guard, and then from there I got out into um, ground level civilian EMS and FEMA work and stuff like that. And the I got I stumbled into this field because I was working on an emergency management degree. And we were doing the forest work. Common conversation for the last. And a comment that I remember just kind of brought up that you can put numbers on this stuff. And that those numbers in time is like these bigger ideas. And some of these ideas are energy and watershed, right? And it's just, it's just this whole kind of topography of risks. And the conversation that I hear like kids in the field that steward and manage these is kind of in parts of the table it is the same conversation that I heard pre Katrina. Like when FEMA showed up in my board and only at that moment they realized like no one knew anything. No one knew each other. No one there were no partnerships or connections. And that's why it was such a disaster. And so like coming out of that, there was this big kind of theme of push. So like, no, 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 no. We're not going to reactively think. You're going to proactively make phone calls and find people that know what they're doing and connect, connect them together. So you're going to go to universities, you're going to go to state legislators, and you're going to find all these people that don't realize how much they know as a group. And you're going to start clicking them together so that they find them. And that's how I mean, subsequent reactions have been so much better. It's not magic. Sandy, like, like the recent fire seasons out west, actually pretty thin compared to prior ones in large part because fire is thin. So my question is, is like in this, you know, in our kind of mutual fields, what could be provided on top of what already exists? as a forum or a networking mechanism to connect all of these brilliant wonderful smart hard work and communication together that don't realize they actually know more interest than they should take it. Um come down to the Google Law Conference and Great Day on the panel of water resources department on space based plant. Um so on one Friday morning that's what we so Oregon, there's a lot of different I mean, we really are bringing people together. Um, there are grants called regional conservation um, partnerships that NRC has. Um, Oregon routinely gives more than any other um, state. Um, there's uh, a partnership planning grant that um, EPA gives. We have used drinking water. Or can just got more than any other um, So you, if you want to know about how folks work together to do this, not around the world, it, it's actually here in Oregon. So the Water Resources Department in Oregon has been funding a field pilot program with culture based plans to help out the water. Bringing people together that don't normally work together, don't normally even talk, to develop a, a plan around the network. It, it covers um, uh, rules that you might want to change or statutes you want to change. It, it covers options, it covers 
background restoration uh, fish and wildlife habitat. Um, so partners are all over the um, We have um, a program uh, in Oregon Department of Ag called the Implementation Area. So again, it's bringing local partners, DEC, OESW, OM, ODA together to do a one of the um, and then OM has a program called Polish Investment Partnerships where we commit um, $12 million over the six years for a local community to have a plan to work their way through the, the restoration practices in that plan for the open shade route, for addressing fire, um, we're addressing fish and wetlands, and snow and lake species. Um, so what do you need? What are the products to get together to make that happen? Is, um, First, folks have to have a desire. Um, out in Burns County, um, if you will go and talk to those people, we actually have a grant out there also with them um, on the next part of the executive um, relationship to the wetlands and the park management. The, um, the, the people want to work together. They want to solve the problem locally. So if there's a spark, and then if there's multiple years later, I don't know if they're willing to invest in that spark, they're going to find locally. Um, and so we have a lot of I just said that uh, Lindsay and I are organizations are members of something called the Oregon Community Participants Network, which is over 50 organizations from the state, from Oregon Food Bank to um, Ten River Food Lab um, and some local um, organizations that work on food access um, and uh, agriculture in um, a bunch of different ways. And there are some uh, teams that work on specific issues together. So I'm a member of the Access Plan team, um, an organization that's a member of the Big Improper Management team. So we work collaboratively on projects, you know, like outreach, research projects, and embedding um, research outcomes. So um, they have a community of leaders that are very valuable. We're going to be talking about policy. Those diversity, equity, and inclusion is the last one. We'll go back. So we all um, learn together, and um, sometimes there's no clear or concrete outcome for it, but there's, it's all reliable. Yeah. I'd like to add something. Uh, last year's legislature passed the NFL 978, and uh, there was widespread, they're evaluating how to change the utility business model and what's moving forward. And uh, the stakeholder process in the 1978 process is really a very small stakeholder from the different process. We have different walks of life. We have Quakers, uh, Latino advocates, consumer advocates, yeah. and cyber-nationalistic, solar people, super non-renewable, private plant owners, all small walks of life. And what I felt really facilitated that process is people were given access to funding. Do string on projects that don't have a lot of access to these content before they go from uh, mentor to sale on the big trip there. They were reimbursed for their time and their expenses were covered. It was really helpful with this process and I learned a lot of the relationship keep happening. So I heard just like just a quick ball, I heard like a common thread of like funding. Mm -hmm. So where is the funding coming from? And if I had a magic wand, so if I had my, like, if I brought it with you and I could make it better, what would I do? And we're watering tickets. So, Oregon is really unique in the fact yeah. that, so, Oregon Water Street is coming from where I first moved to here in the middle of the way in that point. So, 20 years ago, in every county in the state, this is the work that we value. Put a value in fish and wildlife habitat. So, Oregon Washington has to support the Center for Habitat and Wildlife Fund to do um, for funding for the Habitat Community. Um, so, we are a granting agency to give out grants to do all sorts of work. Um, trying to get funding right now for the legislature for the Oregon and Heritage Program to be more than ever for the because our funding has to be the way it is what my and the people that make that work happen. So I manage the program to help the people. Yeah. I think it, it's always hard as a nonprofit and sending for coalition work. 
seeing that there is fewer deliverables section, a lot of funders are very many of the deliverables and outcomes, whereas coalition work sometimes, I mean, you can point to deliverable, but it's really tangential and you might have to get it for the same time. So it is hard for funders to for that kind of work to happen as itself. And they want to see you know, um, measurable things. Oh. Um, but they also, you know, we as an organization have a from the beginning from our grant to development program grant, big federal grant, um, that we always are set up for, but federal funding system is um, a nightmare in a lot of people. We as a small organization have a hard time putting it with the limited to the funds. They don't trust us when we say we use the organization for four years. Um, they have a set of grant reviewers.
10 years ago when I got out of undergrad, um, she said, you need to figure out what and I worked for a lot of nonprofits in the last 10 years, and I still haven't decided uh, if I had what it takes to be patient with the process of applying for grants, uh, the cyclical nature that nonprofits have, uh, is this going to work this time? Uh, we need more capacity to do this if this is going to happen this time. Um, or if I'm more excited by uh, the reason I thought I came to school here, which was working within uh, the system of government to affect the change. Um, so, my question for you is are you boundary pushers or are you compromisers? And how does that affect where you have? <laughs> <laughs> I'll dip my toe in the water. Uh, I work a lot, I do a lot of uh, policy. I come, but when it comes to the race perspective, I'm a compromiser. A lot of times we uh, compromise when it comes to race. We have a contested legal position, and there's the utility position, where the privacy is my position, and we need somewhere in the middle. Um, and that's simply because uh, it's fixed utilities, there's one of me, and a lot of the utility asymmetrical is how it works. But we do the best we can. Um, yeah, I'll say that I think it's, you know, and it's kind of just a the broader like, life philosophy here, but it's really not just like black and white, it's really anything, it's just a lot of different shades of gray. And I think that, you know, at times you need to kind of think about what you want in terms of the long, long term effects of your advocacy. Maybe at times be willing to compromise. I, mean, I think the reason why I went to law school and the reason why I kind of you know, moved out west and went to UO and did all that is because I really did want to. And I consider myself to be an activist kind of in, in my background. And I that, you know, I went to school, the work that I wanted to do, I wanted to kind of, you know, really, really break things up. But I've realized through the work that I do at Cup that um, we're able to really make some profound change in the way that we do this you know, conductive business um, by, you know, Sitting at the table with them and negotiating in earnest. And, you know, I've also worked at a place that I worked at Wilderness Nonprofit in Utah, and that was, all right, let's go to the BLM office and just bang our head against the wall and yell at the oil and gas people, and we'll help you, all the motorized people, and then they'll yell at us. And we'll be like, what we do, and by the end of it, really nothing happens. Or you get a victory in a very short time. But if you can, like, really kind of demonstrate that you can be an active advocate while, you know, working within the parameters of, uh, and, you know, like, you know, administrative rules and the regulatory process that you go through. So it's very kind of like, you know, definitely the space that you work in, but also be somebody that, you know, like, I realize it really benefits my advocacy to kind of get to know the people really well and just kind of be a good guy, you know, like, in terms of the gas company and things like that, like, you know, Maybe we'll be in like a case settlement conference one day, so we can come over here a couple of days later, and maybe there's a day that we can send a motion to be like, call them up, and like, oh yeah, like your bunch of words. So that, those kind of relationships help my work as well. So, um, you know, we have our work in terms of, you know, changing the ways that the utilities do business, we can call up this, really minimizing risk to rate pairs. I realize that, you know, all that stuff doesn't have to be paid, and sometimes you have to pay compliments. Way, but I, have this well. oh. yeah. <laughs> I think for us, for like our work, is about pushing boundaries until you're at that point where you're willing to compromise. So I think it's like it's kind of a hand to hand thing. Because um, I was, but I think that's you know, for me personally, and most things that we do, we'd rather accept the incremental change than nothing at all. So you push the boundary, like in policy, you push the boundary past where someone's willing to accept it, and sometimes you lose your opportunity. Right? But, uh, you know, so I think that there's a big gap for sure. Um, but, and a lot of the work that we do, we're um, picking up the small guys, city capital, and we don't have the same resources that the big organizations do, and we really well, we just don't have the same financial resources. Um, and that's a reality of working in policy and working in capital. Um, and so um, we have to put boundaries. 
but we also often have to compromise the more decision change. So I think it has to do with the same spectrum. I'm super curious, someone who's been in government for 12 years, how do you expect to do this? So I started working on something that is in with the world and all that kind of stuff. Um, and what I have learned is. It's walking the fine line. It's, it's, the, um, it's willing to be bold and innovative um, when there is the space to do so. But also, um, to me, the the compromises I have made over time have probably been far more rewarding than the times I've been bold. Usually, the compromises are from listening to people with a very different perspective, which has been helped me form a better policy decision. So you can be bold and innovative, but it's only going to get you so far if you're not willing to listen and learn and do that. I do think that I would use those two. I'd say that organizing is a downgrade in compliance in itself. Because um, it integrates agriculture and conservation to things that people think of as being artists that don't know the actually and organizations that are on the future um, are there are very few things that they're on the same side about. Um, and that is actually one of the um, biggest selling points for that bill um, and that program. Um, I'd also say that boundary pushing is just if it's in and of itself, like if that's what you're doing, it's exhausting and probably bad karma. Like just to keep on doing that, it's just not it's not rewarding, like personally for me. Awesome, thank you. Did you see a law school <clears throat> takeaway that helped make this more term? Well, I I was at law school before I heard this, so I already I already been through law school and seen that process, seen the case law and the progression over time and you know how things change over time and that's a really cool perspective. And then I was at a food security conference and a very innovative uh, food bank person from Toronto who was kind of the keynote speaker said relentless incrementalism. Mm -hmm. You relentlessly push push, push, right? You don't expect to get from here to there. You relentlessly push toward your goal. And I heard another version of that recently, uh, radical gradualism, right? <laughs> it's really the only way things actually get done in the world. So you can put both of them in your back box. You know, like, no. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I believe that is also, thank you guys so much for coming. We really appreciate being able to hear your perspective and your stories uh, as an undergraduate and even as a graduate. It's, it's very helpful to see how other people have taken their education and gone with it. So we really appreciate having you here today. I have one other question. For those that come in came in late, I would just reiterate that we all said like informational interviews or like golden and don't be afraid to ask.